Uh, my name is Matthew Bergman. I'm here to talk to you today about computing machinery and intelligence, aka the imitation game paper, aka the Turing test paper. To give some context, it was published in Mind 49 on October 1st, 1950. That was 68 years ago. Mind is a quarterly published peer-reviewed journal. Its seminal works include Lewis Carroll's What the Tortoise Said to Achilles in 1895, Bertrand Russell's On Denoting in 1905, and this paper. Mind is a philosophical journal. Plot twist. This is a philosophical paper. So with that being said, and they told me I would never get to do a philosophical paper at Papers We Love. Shall we play a game? Turing begins with the question, can machines think? He then immediately says this question, as stated, is ambiguous and useless. If the meaning of the word machine and think are to be found by examining how they are commonly used, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that the meaning and the answer to the question, can machines think, is to be sought in a statistical survey such as a Gallup poll. But this is absurd. We will get to how, why he thinks this is absurd in a few moments. So instead, he replaces this problem with another problem. Problem. Though really, it's a game. And really, three games. The first game that he describes is where you have an interrogator, which he labels C, talking to two different participants, which he labels X and Y, one of which uh, is a woman, B. Yes, he uses two separate labels. And another, A, a man. And it's all kind of a word soup jumble of terms about liars and non-liars, and it's also completely pointless for actually understanding the second imitation game he brings up, where you have basically an interrogator once again. But this time, instead of a man, you have a person and a machine. And so you get asking the... the all right, so the imitation game that he describes is where you basically decide which one is which, which is the human, which is the machine. But if you notice, you're only going to get... You have 50... I'm sorry, guys. I always get really nervous when I'm getting talks. But I'm going to continue. So to restate what this imitation game is actually going on, they're both hidden from you, but you are actually going to get the machine 50% of the time. Turing says later in this paper that he wants a machine 50 years in the future to only be detected 70% of the time. And you're also probably wondering at this point, this sounds kind of vaguely familiar, but it doesn't seem to ring a bell for what I think about when I think about the Turing test. And that's because you're thinking of the third game, where you have a jury of interrogators asking a participant hidden from view questions in a five-minute interval, and from those questions deciding if that participant is a man or a machine. That's not in this paper. That's actually said by Turing in 1952 on the BBC. I think that's really interesting to consider that nothing in this paper that I'm talking to you about is something you know. It's something you thought you know, but you don't. And also, we're only on page three, guys. This is a 22-page paper. So we really need to ask ourselves, what the hell am I going to talk about next? Because obviously there's a lot more to go on. So after talking about the imitation game, Turing sets out why he feels it is a good way to test intelligence. And that's because to Turing, intelligence is not how somebody looks or how they, what they physically can do, but how they respond to stimuli. This is, of course, as long as... Uh, Guys, never present. It's always terrible. No, I'm not. I'm doing okay at best. Yes, I mean, ah, we'll actually get to that very soon. That's little as you, little. Well, maybe I am, for all you know. What? So, oh. All right, going back. So it's how he, one responds to stimuli. Of course, as long as the interrogator thinks it's a rational response. If I say, if I ask you what your favorite color is, but you give me a Shakespeare sonata, which is not a real thing, because I would not sonnet. Oh, Lord, Matthew. Continuing. So after laying out why he thinks the imitation game is a good thing, he then states what type of machines can take this test. The qualifications is laid out, or it can be a black box. 
you don't need to know how the inner workings, you don't need to know about the inner workings. All that matters is that it actually responds as you think it should. And also that any technique can work. Only not really, because he then goes on this weird tangent where you have a group of male engineers or single sex engineers creating a human maculae that can actually take the test. Now he doesn't want to consider that. And if you haven't noticed, this paper gets a little weird. So honestly, I, he lied and only he wants to use digital computers. And really of those, only Turing complete computers. And then he goes into how they would work with the store and an executive unit and a control. And the bulk of this section is very familiar with anybody with a basic CS understanding, uh, anybody with basic CS understanding. And the question is, why is he bringing all this up? Why does he need to tell us about all this? And that's because at this time, Van Neumann's AVIC report is only five years old. AVIC standing for Electronic Discrete Variable Atomic Computer. This thing right here. It was the first binary digital computer. Beforehand, we've had computers, but they were written in base 10. We're still figuring out how storage would work, how all this would work, because it was still an open question how a computer would actually function and be programmed. And the use of digital computer throughout this paper is actually very important, because there aren't just there aren't only digital computers, there are human computers. He worked with a great deal of them back in World War II at Bre Benchley Park, solving Crane's equation and trying to crack Enigma. I think it really does define how he thinks about what this question means. And so after he states all this, he finally gets back to what the replacement question is. Because if you notice, a game isn't a problem, it's a game. So the new question, that he wants to pose is, are there matchable digital computers which would do well in the imitation game? He then, for eight pages, then goes back to the original question and basically sets up straw man arguments dismissing why you would not think a machine can think. It's basically a bait and switch, and it's very, very weird because it's very much a word soup right here, and I can't paraphrase it down to anything more than what he actually said, which is, we cannot altogether abandon the original form of the problem. From opinions will differ as to the appropriateness of the substitution, and we must at least listen to what has to be said in connection. The original question, can machines think, I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. Nevertheless, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have all Altered so much that one will be able to speak of the machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Basically, we're going to change how we feel about machines, but I still want to bring up these objections because I want to show how smart I am. So the first objection he brings up is the theological objection that machines don't have souls. And I'm sorry guys, but we actually need to stop and discuss something. Turing says in this section, and I quote, how do Christians regard the Muslim view that women have no souls? Yeah. Yeah, that's in there. That's a direct quote. This was actually a commonly accepted Islamophobic corner in intellectual circles at the time. There are papers examining this. There are things from the New York Times in 1973 still repeating this untruth. And it's unacceptable and incredibly stupid. And I bring this up because you have to consider Turing is spending so much time and energy on these broken assumptions, straw man arguments, on this really interesting question about machines in, a, in basically science fiction land because none of this existed back at the time. There was mo no machine learning. There was no proof that this could actually be. But you can't spend five minutes to consider how unlikely this whole idea of a religious sect dismissing half its population to be or asking anybody else. It got into a peer-reviewed journal. It's repeated ad nauseum in so many different places. We are dealing with these things right now. I know I'm harping on it a little bit, but it needs to be said because it's uncomfortable to bring up. And we need to whenever we see it. It's incredibly important. Especially with our heroes, and especially with our history. To continue, the first objection is the theological objection, the fact that machines don't have souls. Turing counters this with, religion, with saying that religious texts have already been disproven before, such as Galileo and Copernicus, and also brings up the idea that if we construct a machine good enough that it can beat the imitation game, well, God could just stuff the soul right into the machine because he's God. His second objection, which he, which he labels the head in the sand objection, is that, uh, to paraphrase, 
I don't want to consider the ramifications of a machine being intelligent, so I'll ignore it, this, and never consider it. His counter is that this is a bad argument. <laughs> yes, Turing, that's why it's a paragraph long and why you should cut it out. The third, more interesting objection he wants to bring up is the mathematical objection. That by logic, we have already proven there are certain questions that to this day we know logical systems cannot, be, cannot answer. Uh, these are shown in things such as Godel's incompleteness theorem and Turing's own paper on computable numbers with an application to the Eschendungen problem. Uh, his counter is that human intelligence might also have this limitation. Also, you need to keep in mind that to take advantage of that, you would need to know the inner workings of the machine so well for it to even show up that in daily conversation it wouldn't matter. And also that Lucas Penrose might have a couple of questions and answers to say about this whole idea about uh, the limitations of human thought. The fourth objection uh, it, Turing wants to talk about is the argument from consciousness that we are only seeing the external indicators of intelligence through the imitation game, through how the machine is responding. We aren't machines. We can't truly know what they think. Turing counters that this is the same for everyone who isn't you, to the person sitting next to you, to me right now speaking to you. You don't know if I'm intelligent. I could be just controlled by an angel pulling my strings, much like what Descartes, Descartes says in his Discourse of the Method of rightly conducting one's reason and of seeking truth in the sciences in, that was published in 1637. This is an old idea, but it still does relate to this paper. You probably know it from I Think Therefore I Am or Cogito Ergo Sum, and this circles back to the beginning. This is why Turing considers the question, can a machine think as meaningless or absurd? We can't even know if the person sitting next to us is intelligent, let alone a machine. So that's why it's meaningless. So it is interesting to consider that he never wants to state this outright. You have to read really between the lines to actually get to that point. The fifth objection that he brings up is the argument from various disabilities. And we actually have two different arguments here. One is which machines don't have emotions, so they will not respond the same way you would think a human being would respond. His counter to this is that we can build a machine that overcomes these barriers with enough storage space. And also the fact that machines can't make mistakes. It can have a diversity of behavior. Input in equals input out. You will always get the same thing out that you put in. Hence, you will recognize them as a machine from that. His counter again, is that we can build a machine that overcomes these barriers with enough storage space. And that moreover, there is a difference between errors of conclusion and errors of function. Machines will eventually make mistakes, in his opinion, because this leads right to his sixth objection, Lady Lovelace, which comes from Lady Lovelace's, where she says in one of her memoirs, the analytical engine has no pretension to originate anything it can do anything. Let me repeat. The analytical engine has no pretension to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. He paraphrases this as machines can't surprise us. We already know what they will do. But his counter is that they do surprise us every single day. They surprise him daily, mostly about how he's constructing them, but he still thinks this is a, a point to consider. And he actually has Douglas Hartree be the one that actually is quoting Ada Lovelace, and a weird twist to actually show that people are agreeing with him, that machines can actually learn to have biological terms and reflexes, and it's all kind of muddled. And also, guess what? He has an additional counter. We can build a machine that overcomes these barriers with enough storage space. That seems to just be his answer to everything. Dream bigger. And we, but we do know this is true because we see it every day now with machine learning. This has come to pass. With enough storage space, we have seen machines surprise us to come with new conclusions and things we were not expecting before. He then uh, adds to this the argument from continuity in the nervous system. The humans, that, the, that how we think, how our brains work, is probably not a discrete state. And this is one of the weirder ones because this is one that actually talks directly about the imitation game where he counters the interrogator can't take advantage of this. He also sets up a new imitation game where the machine is pretending to be an analytical engine so that it could actually be non-continuous and it's all kind of be, why are you talking about this Turing? How is this actually a good thing? What are you proving with this? Uh, he goes back to something a little bit more interesting again with the argument for informality of behavior, that there is no rule book from, for how to be a human, which leads right back to the fifth argument about the disabilities, that basically that p there are different ways of acting and you can't have the same input and output, and guess what? The same counter. We can build a machine that overcomes these barriers with enough storage space. 
And those are the basic ones, though there is one last objection we need to get to, which is argument from extrasensory perception. Yes, this is in the paper. And yes, he truly believed that telepathy was a thing. These disturbing phenomena seem to deny all our usual scientific ideas, how we should like to discredit them. Unfortunately, the statistical evidence, at least for telepathy, is overwhelming. Uh, to him, telepathy would be a way to basically prove a human is not a machine because the human would actually be able, through their ESP powers, to get the cards the interrogators are holding or vice versa. Uh, though a machine could not, and from there you can test that the machine isn't a human. His counter is that there are ways of tying up the test, but it's really badly argued because, uh, surprise, ESP doesn't exist. So it's not very well argued, and I won't bore you with the details of building an ESP-proof room. <laughs> so the final section is just him talking about how he actually envisions machines learning. And, and Turing describes this as vi very idealized and symbolic, uh, but it's complete with a child program and education, and it's really kind of cute. But it does give a surface level understanding how to think about this. And for the 1950s, it's actually quite in depth for when you're dealing with just like 48 bits of RAM or whatever you have back then. Anyway, to wrap up, I think you have realized, at least to me, this paper is a mess. There are seeds of great ideas, but they are very, very poorly argued. And it's interesting because nearly all of us have heard of this the Turing test. All of us thought we knew what this paper would be about. But I bet very few of us have actually read it before. And I think it just proves that knowing the source material and the meme that spawns from it are a very different thing. And I think it also has uh, flattened out how we think about machines because intelligence in machines might come in many forms. We all know dolphins are intelligent. Uh, elephants are intelligent. They don't talk to us by language. We don't need a machine to talk to us by language to be recognized as something worthwhile and something uh, based in human intelligence. And this is somewhat because Turing is just spending all this time on these bad faith wackadoo arguments that have no validity or just Islamophobic. We all think the history of these ideas are clearer and crisper and more simplified than they actually are. I really do think that this paper points that we just need to read more, we need to think more, we need to discuss more. In this, and this is why I love Papers Free Love, because this is, gives me the opportunity to do s things like this. Anyway, my name is Matthew Bergman. You can find me everywhere at Photoverte. Thank you very much.